Um, I wanted to talk about not uh, coding in uh, Emacs Lisp per se, but more the tools, the things that help you code in Emacs Lisp more profitably. If you want to learn Lisp and Emacs Lisp itself, uh, there's documentation out there I recommend going to. Um, if you are just sort of getting into Emacs Lisp, the reason why I like Emacs Lisp, Lisp so much is that it's a very fun language to program in. It's sort of very quick to see the results of what you do. It's very easy to get documentation. The debugger is very nice to use, as I will show you. My whole, pro my whole professional life until very recently, um, I've been a C programmer. And C, it gets old after a while because it's not a very exciting scene. We're not doing a lot of crazy stuff in C. Uh, I don't know if you know, but C11 just came out, the 2011 version of the C standard. It's like nobody knows even that that happened. And, and even I was asking the C people what's new, and it's kind of hard for them to tell me because it doesn't change very fast. Um, but my refuge from C was the Emacs list. Um, and we have great tools in Emacs for writing an Emacs list. One of the ones that's come about recently um, and is now part of Emacs is ZRT. So as you're writing your Emacs list, you can write tests. It was very common in the old days when you're writing your Emacs list to write little snippets of code on the side and then evaluate them in the buffer to see what they would do. Well, now you just do the same thing, but you take the code that you write off on the side and you put it into a little test. So I'll take this test here, and the tests are very, very simple. Instead of giving you a huge vocabulary of assertions that, for example, JUnit might give you, the, the basis of a test is it, it succeeds if it doesn't throw an exception. That's it. The easiest way to throw an exception is to assert. So I have an assert one here. If I take that out and I evaluate my test, you can't see my real mode line. That's the problem. How, resize what? My frame. How do I even do that? <laughs> yeah, I'm on the Mac. Yeah, well, let me do this. Let me let me leave uh, EX here and come back in and see. I know, <laughs> but I got pretty good startup time there. Um, let me see if I can bring the bottom of my Emacs up. Uh huh. There we go. Right. Too wide. Okay. Right, let me go over here. Yeah. All right. So we're, yay. All right. Let's load org present again. <clears throat> all right. Not very, not very well rehearsed. Uh, Okay, so we have our ERT, we, we evaluate it, and now you just type meta x ERT, and it will ask you for the test that you want to run, and the, it picks the foo, foo by default here, and you run it, and it'll tell you how many tests passed and how many tests failed. That's it. And it'll give you little colored dots here to show you success and failure. So I can come back here, I can change my assert to be nil, run ERT again, and now we see down here that I have one failure, an unexpected failure. And it failed because there was an assertion thrown. And that's it. Very simple. Now when I write modules, I tend to just build up these tests one after the other, and I never throw them away. Just leave them in the file. And then you, if somebody has a problem with your code, you can tell them, oh, could you just run e ERT? I know it's in your Emacs because it comes with Emacs. Uh, tell me if you get the same results as I do. All right. Apropos. I was talking earlier today about the discoverability of the Emacs environment, and one of the thing, one of the key tools for discovering new stuff inside of Emacs when you're doing Emacs list programming is MetaX apropos. There are many different apropos commands available. You can see down here we've got, you can find library values. Uh, apropos value is actually really interesting. That searches the other way behind variables. So say you have a path name, and you know that path name is coming from some variable you don't know what variable it is, you can do apropos value, put in the snippet of the path name you're looking for, and it'll tell you all the variables that contain that path name in it. So it's very neat. Uh, apropos documentation, so we'll search documentation strings. A lot of times I have, I know that the function I'm looking for is out there, I've forgotten what it's called. I'll use apropos uh, to get to it, and I have a quick, I'm, I put all these behind quick meetings. Um, since while I'm developing an Emacs list, there are a lot of functions I rely on which don't have key bindings by default. So I have created two different key maps myself. Uh, I, re I recommend this. I created Control C E to be the functional things I do when I'm Emacs list programming, and Control H E, which is things that are like help. So my Control C E ones are, for example, evaluate my current buffer or toggle debug on error. 
this is probably the one I use the most. Uh, byte compile and then reload the file that I'm in. Eval the current region that I have selected. And jump to the scratch buffer, creating the scratch buffer if I've killed it somehow. So I, if, I'm, if I grab a code snippet and I want to I muck with it some and I don't want to do it in the buffer I was in, I just need the key binding to snap me over to the scratch buffer, paste it in, set it to whatever mode I need it to be. And in my list app, I have things like um, go to the messages buffer. Because I usually missed what you were trying to show me in the mode line. I want to go see it again. Uh, I have find function and find function that's on a key. Very, very common used. Um, and I, ha I have the I do hacks mode so that when I type control H E F, you can see I can select between, you know, if I type print, I can select very quickly between all the functions that have that name in it. So sometimes I don't even need apropos if I'm just doing a by name lookup for a function I know is out there. Find library is interesting when you've got. I've got lots and lots and lots of Emacs packages installed in my environment, and I do not want to remember what path name they all live under. So control H E L, which is find library built in function in Emacs, will just give me another I do selection here, and I could type say org dash, and now here's all the list files loaded, all the packages loaded that I have on my system that begin with org. I can just select org agenda, and now I'm in the org agenda file. So that allows me to be pretty much file system insensitive. And of course, that apropos value I was telling you about. Uh, oh, and find variable. Find variable is also very useful. Go to where the variable is defined. So I have, it took me years to figure out, to finally do this. For the longest time, I was doing meta x and then these various commands. <laughs> it tears you down after a while. It's like Chinese wall torture of Emacs programming. So be brave. Create key maps for yourself. Create your own private key maps. Like, I wasn't using a control period for anything. So control period is not my new favorite ancillary key map uh, to go along with control X and control C. Macro step. Macro step is absolute magic. Uh, I discovered macro step because in the slime world, they have something like this for common list. And I missed it so badly that I went to look it up and found out somebody had written this for Emacs list. So use package is one of the macros I use for loading, um, loading code. It doesn't go out to the world and get stuff for you like ELGET does. This is for packages you already have on your own system, and it's my own little recipe for configuring the package. And it does a lot of stuff behind the scenes for me. It's a nasty macro. If I type control C E M, what it does is it takes the top level of the macro, the, the, the outermost enclosing macro, and replaces it with its definition, substituting in all the subforms that were there. And you see these little bars under the white keyword? That means these are sub macros within my macro. So I can go to one of these and do control H E M and it will substitute the when with the macro that it represents. And I'm in a special view mode here called macro stepper, as you can see in my mode line. So I can hit Q at any time and I go back to my original text. It's not actually modifying my buffer to show me this stuff. It's just progressively revealing my macro. And that makes writing macros so much easier. Really. Um, eval expression is, a, is another add-on module. I have totally pimped the metacolon because I use it for so many things. Eval expression, one other thing it's doing for me is it's plugging in a PP library for doing pretty printing of list expressions and curtailing them if they get too long because I don't want to see like 300K worth of list uh, values output into my buffer. So I do stuff like, um, oh, what's one that's going to print something worthwhile? I don't even know. Uh, yeah, I was going to say memory use counts, but the problem is, is that it's online. So anyway, imagine that being pretty and being multiple lines. <laughs> yeah, I know it's kind of amazing when you when you just think about it. Org agenda custom commands is that a control X? Oh, oh, it's a variable. Okay. Oh yeah, that that one's nasty. All right, it's void because I haven't loaded org yet. So let's load or load org here. Okay, now, there we go. So it, it colorizes it, does all the nifty stuff so that it looks like a normal list, the way it would look in a list buffer. Um, the other thing I did was, I'm gonna talk about power edit in a moment, and I very highly recommend going and watching the Emacs Rocks uh, screencast on power edit. Like somebody said on Twitter, if you're not the type of person who uses power edit, you need to become the type of person who power edit was made for. Um, I have changed it so that my meta colon prompt uses power edit. So I just have to open, you know, I type the opening parent of something, I type let, two opening parents, close parents. Um, 
And these little types of things, I mean, the small, they add up. And it adds up to much, much quicker productivity, and you're doing lots of Lisp coding overall. Uh, and, and other things that you'll use all the time as a Lisp developer is Control Meta X to reevaluate the current thing under point, and Control X, Control E. So if I'm sitting in a buffer and I'm deep somewhere in some form, and oh, I just want to, I just want the, to do this ad hook that's here. I don't want to run the function that does the ad hook. I can just Control H, Control E, and it evaluates the thing before my cursor. Paredit. All right, so Paredit is amazing. So Paredit, in an Emacs Lisp buffer, there is never a time when it is rational for there to be an irregular number of parentheses. There should always be an equal number of closing parentheses to opening parentheses at all times. And Paredit enforces this at the editing layer. Whenever you want to create some, you, you type an opening parenthesis, it gives you the clothing, cro closing parenthesis automatically. If you go and try and delete that closing parenthesis, it will delete the opening parenthesis with it. So it tries to keep your buffer always in a sane state with respect to Lisp programming. Um, and it gets smarter, too. If I grab some big old block of code here, and I come down here and I paste it here, it will auto, um, it didn't do what I thought it would do. It's supposed to auto reindent uh, relative to where I've inserted it. So I'm just going to pretend that I didn't say that. Um, the other thing that Paredit can do really well, <laughs> yeah, I know, it's kind of, let's see, where am I in my dot .emacs here? It's like a zoo. <laughs> seriously, it seriously is. I'm not kidding. Um, so if I'm here and I realize, oh, uh, this prog n, I don't want both of these forms to be in this prog n. That thing that that not form just down there, I want it to go outside the prog n. So I can I can barf it out. And barfing out as xp means take it out of this xp that I'm in and push it outside of me. And so that's just control curly brace. We'll barf it out. Then control parent will slurp it back in. And that's the terms that it uses for these types of things. Manually using kill, uh, yank and pop and kill or whatever all they're called to take sex peas in and out, they, it's not as bad as it could be because we have control meta K and meta Y, but when you use barfing and slurping enough, it just starts to add up again to some, to, to some serious time savings. And there are some things that I've added to it as well, like, um, let's see here. I added one which is, see, see how I have two forms inside this prog n, the set Q and the not? If I type control meta squiggly brace, so control squiggly brace is to barf the last sex B out. Control meta squiggly brace will barf out everything from my point onward. So take everything out of the sex B following the point that I'm at. And that little snippet of code is on, is on Emacs Wiki on the, on the par edit page. Anyway, I can't live without par edit now. If I try to edit list code without par edit, I just end up with a whole bunch of opening parentheses. <laughs> Seriously, I don't type closing parentheses anymore. I mean, it's even smart enough to say that if I go into this let and I type opening parenthesis and I hit the close parent, it now creates a new line for me properly indented, so I can just keep typing these things in as long as I want to. Uh, if I don't want the close parenthesis to go to the next line, there's a way to do it that I've completely forgotten how to do, so you can tell I never do that. Okay. Check parents. Like I said, your buffer should always be in a sane state, so there's a way to enforce that. On my after save hook for any Emacs list buffer, I call the function check parents, which makes it an error to try and save list files that don't have matching parents. It is, it is extremely rare for this check to actually catch me because of par edit. The times it catches me are when I've marked out a region and used control W to clip it out. That's the only time par edit will not stop you from chopping out a parent uh, and making them uneven. So that's just a little little productivity tip I, I get. What's that? Oh, why not before a save hook? Yeah. Because I, I want my work saved. <laughs> I don't I want to have to spend, you know, what if, what if I have to run out the door right that minute? There's a fire in the house. I want to make sure that that got saved. It's now uploading from Dropbox, and I can run out of the house. But if it were before a save hook, that work paradigm wouldn't work. Oh, by the way, if anybody has questions, this talk has a lot of space in it, so feel free to ask what questions you have or experiences you've had with other packages. Uh, Redshank is another very cool package by the same guy who wrote Paredit. This is refactoring for Emacs Lisp. So, like, say I'm in this prog in here, this let. Uh, let's, let's pull this out into a split, a real Emacs Lisp buffer. I'm here, and I, I have this foo function that I've called, and I've passed in hello world. 
But I realized, you know what, I'm going to use the result of that hello world call a few times. So I can type, turn on red shank mode. I have to type control X, control R, L. Whoa, I'm not in red shank mode. Am I? There we go. Control X, control R, L. And it'll say, what variable name do you want that sub sex P to have? I type B, and it will find the nearest enclosing let. Put it there, name it, come back, give me my variable name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I'm in this pro or I'm in this prog end and I'm like, oh, you know what? This prog end really doesn't need to be a prog end. You can type control X, control R, what is it? Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be, oh, you have to be on the prog end. It'll just suck the prog end out. It'll take everything that was under the prog end and unprogenify it. Um, there's also a function that will condify an if. So you've written if, and you have the else, and you realize, oh, no, there's a third condition. How many of us have rewritten that by hand as a con? Okay, so red chain can condify. Let me see if it'll actually work. I haven't used it in a while. So we have, all right, and I'm on the if. I have to be on the if. I can, yeah, there we go. I condify it. Yeah. So, so red chain, little known package, but a lot of power. It does, it does do other, um, it does do some other stuff too. Let's see, let's, what's the, so we've got, it'll, It'll whenify forms, and it'll rewrite a negated predicate. So if you want to switch it from a when to an unless, it'll do that in one key press for you. All right. ELP. Um, Emacs, you know, it's funny. I remember using GNU's and other tools in Emacs in 1999, and I'm now using them today, and my perception of Emacs being faster is not really that remarkable. It kind of feels like the same experience. And I don't know what to exactly attribute that to, but I do find it is quite important to profile your code because Emacs does a lot of causing a lot of garbage collection behind the scenes that can be degrading speed in ways that you never quite perceive because we do accept a certain amount of slowness out of Emacs Lisp, right? We're not expecting this to be compiled C code, but there's a lot you can do to gain back speed from Emacs. Um, when I was working on eShell once, I was using it one day on my laptop, and it was incredibly slow. Like, I would type a command and hit return, and it'd be three seconds until it output the, the prompt. Well, I realized later it was because I was using a really, really old laptop, and had I been using a modern machine, I would have never even noticed this. But because of the slowness on that laptop, I went and I used ELP, and I found exactly where the problem was and took it out, and now it was usable on the laptop, and now incredibly fast on the desktop. But it would have never done it on the desktop because it wasn't really pressing. But ELP is extremely easy to use. Like, you can say EL, meta x ELP instrument uh, package, and you give it the prefix letter of the package you want to instrument. So we're going to say GNU's, right, because everybody loves GNU's. And then we will run GNU's. It tells me I should byte compile it. That's because I have instrumented it. And it now I can say ELP results, and I will see here kind of hard to see. I will see a list of all the functions that, all the instrumented functions that ran, how many times they were called, and what the elapsed time was both for that function invocation itself and total. Sometimes just looking at this list is all you need to know. Um, there are times where I'll go down and the function will be fine, and all of a sudden one function will have like four billion calls. And I'll realize, well, that was in some tight inner loop that I, it's the algorithm that I need to fix. So I recommend using ELP. ELP does not at present, give you use memory use counts. If I if I run memory use counts, uh, what I get down here is this is like total bytes that have been allocated, the number of strings that have been allocated, how many bytes in those strings, the number of consts, the number of this, the number of symbols, uh, atoms, that kind of stuff. And what's interesting is you run that, you run your code, you run that again, and then you're like, oh my god, how can I be using that many cons cells? And then you'll start switching from like nconc append to nconc and stuff like that to get back your memory. But there is a hack somewhere on the internet to add this use count information to TLP. So it will accumulate how many cons cells each function is consuming. Uh, but I don't know where it is right now. I just know that it exists. Uh, e-debug. Okay, so if you've used Emacs debugger, the built-in debugger, if you've used the Emacs debugger, it's where you have a function. Mm, let's make a function. Let's make a function foo, make it interactive, we'll just debug. So this was the old days of debugging. So you run foo, and now I'm in the debugger. And if I want, I can hit D to step down. I can hit E to evaluate things in the context of the current frame. This will be kind of familiar to slime 
users is sort of the debugger you get when an exception happens there. But life can be better than that. So we take out our debug and we want to say print hello world. Uh, is print actually a function you access? Yes, it is. Uh, using too many languages. All right. So instead of using control meta x to evaluate your def fun, you use control u control meta x. And now you'll see in my mode lots it's an e debug foo. What this means is that the next time anybody tries to run foo, Emacs is going to stop me, bring up my source buffer, show me that function, and put a little arrow showing me where I've stopped. And I can now use the space key to successively evaluate the subparts of each sexp. If I want, I can use F to go forward and jump over the current sexp. And it's all going to show me in the mini buffer the result of evaluating each thing it just did. So you can step by step watch your function being traced. Yes? So you just mentioned slime, and I was just curious because I've been wondering about it. Is it possible to run Emacs Lisp through slime? It seems like a very basic idea. So you could do everything you're doing, but with everything getting collected into your slime buffer as opposed to just flooding out into messages and going away. Right. It, we've actually discussed this on the IRC channel a couple times. It would require somebody writing a Slack backend for the Emacs Lisp interpreter. Yeah. It, there is nothing that exists today. I am. Yes, I will mention that in a little bit. Yeah, IL is a uh, is a REPL for Emacs Lisp, but it lacks in certain features. Like if there's an exception in the thing that you just evaluated, you won't get a jump into the debugger like you would with Slime. You will just get the error printed out that you would have seen in your mode line. But IL can be handy for building up interactive statements, and then you take those things that you build up in IL and you stick them into an ERT dev test. Anyway, so here I am. I'm in the debugger. I could, hit, I could hit C to continue on. I could hit Q to stop the debugger from running. To stop this function from being debugged anymore, I just hit Control-C, Control-Meta, I mean, sorry, Control-Meta X. Uh, and, and that will evaluate the normal form of that function so that now if I call it, it just does its normal behavior. So very, very easy to use. Very lightweight. You just find the code that you want to find using those other functions I showed you, find function, find library. Go to your function, control U, control meta X, and now just do what you did before. And now you're in the debugger and you can interactively trace. There is a possibility to step through to the next function. It's not one I actually use very often. I don't know the key binding for it. But if you look up eDebug in the manual, it'll step through. Yeah, like step through to the next function being called. Hmm? You gotta do that. Yeah. Oh, it's I. Okay, yeah. But for, strangely enough, I never do it. <laughs> I just never do it. Um, Anyway, I, I live in eDebug. Without eDebug, I couldn't really de develop the Max list, yet somehow there was a day when I did that. One, one unfortunate caveat with eDebug, it's regressed in Emacs 24. An increasingly large amount of the Emacs 24 core is using lexical scope. Than oh, yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, normally in the debugger, if you do CHV or something like that, it will show you the value the variable had at that point in your code. With lexical, with lexical scope, it, you get the value it had at the, t at the top level, which not terribly useful. Yeah. Um, there, uh, it, it is extremely difficult to, uh, uh, to, to modify Emacs core to make it uh, uh, to, to make uh, eDebug have a view of, uh, of the variable value. But my understanding is it, is that it's being worked on. Please. Right. 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 I heard of this. <laughs> I heard of this recently. I have not yet myself lexical binding true code, so I haven't run into it myself. Don't you just hit the E to eval expression and then look at the variable there? And also, when you're in eDebug, if you hit D, you will get an old school backtrace, too, in case you want to see the context of the call. All right, Elint. Elint is an incredibly useful, very trivially easy to use program. You're in some, I won't do it in my dot max, heavens forbid. Uh, let's, let's go to the use package code itself. All right, so in Elint, you just type meta x Elint initialize. And what it will do is it will go read the code for every single dependency that your package has recursively so that it knows it has all the definitions of everything. And after this finishes initializing, I can do elint current buffer. It's basically a bit more in depth than the byte compiler. Byte compiler warnings are a great thing to pay attention to and to fix. Elint is the next step up. So elint current buffer, and there we go. See, I have all these warnings I haven't fixed. I've been bad. Uh, where, where did they go? All right. All right, 
So I have five errors. So it's telling me I'm calling undefined functions. That just means I'm not requiring in the code that I need to to get those functions. So it's possible that if I give this code to somebody else, that they don't load that package in their .emacs file, then this code will error for them. So it's good to make elint shut up. And it's usually a pretty easy thing to do as well. ELDoc, if you don't use that too, that's a lifesaver. So ELDoc is a very simple thing. I'm here in my code, and I'm writing code, and let's see, there's a bunch of functions whose arguments I can never, ever in life remember. One of them would be string match, right? So I type string match, and I hit space, and in my mode line, I just see what the arguments were. Okay, so to a common list people, he, a common list person would be like, okay, I had that 30 years ago. What's exciting about that? Um, there's also a CL doc module out there for Emacs, which will give you specific help on common list functions if you're editing common list code. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and also for Haskell, there's a mode too that will try and give you argument appropriate help. It's incredibly useful. Again, I mean, there's, you can't remember the whole scope of the functions that are available to you as an Emacs Lisp coder. So something like ELDoc is, is a great solution. IOM, as Michael mentioned, IOM, okay, it's like, it's, it's the package that everybody thinks is cool and nobody uses. Is there anybody here who's a veteran IOM user? Oh, wow, okay. My apologies. All right, so I have a prompt here as if I were at the Emacs Lisp machine, and I can type... Um, oh yeah, I've got it in multi-line mode here. I have to go to the. I have to go outside the parameter. It's actually kind of one of the cool things about um, IELM. I have IELM set up so that, of course, Pared is running an IELM mode. And so if I type some really long thing, I want to, I want to do a message. I want to say hello percent s. Now if I hit return, I can just keep uh, doing stuff like this. And then when you go outside and run it, so it's kind of nice for building up multi-line expressions. Anyway, it's cool. Uh, eShell, by the way, can be a poor man's IOM because I, it supports evaluation of Lisp expressions as a prompt. Yeah, it is a feature. <laughs> it's one of the design goals, in fact. So anything you can do in IOM. The, the difference is eShell is not really as good at the multi-line stuff as IOM is or the par edit integration. So IOM is really more focused on the Emacs Lisp evaluation experience. The, the thing with eShell is, is that you could interleave command line commands with Emacs Lisp forms. Uh, does it lack? It, it, is e, it is Emacs Lisp. It's not doing its own interpretation. I'm just calling out to Emacs's read function, read sexp. So in, in eShell, any argument that begins with a parent is interpreted to be a Lisp form, which is evaluated then to get the value of that argument. Um, so you can use them anywhere. You could even say echo one, one plus two, and it would still work. Anyway. Slime nav is, uh, this is another one that I loved in, in Slime World, was if you're in your code and you're looking at something, say, oh, I don't know, some function here that, you're looking at this right contents hooks and you want to go to the definition, you just hit meta period and you're there. You don't, it's not like a tags file. You don't have to build it. You don't have to even enter what it is you want to go to. You just hit mid a period and you're there. I like that about it. It's, um, if you look for slime now, you'll see this out on the web. Emacslisp, elisp slime nav, I think it's called. Yeah, very handy. Um, another thing I like to do is I like to dim my parents to 50% opacity because it's just, a little bit relaxing on the eyes, and I make my lambdas pretty. <laughs> I got that from TWB in the IRC channel, and it, 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 just, it pays off. It's, I don't know, something pretty about them. I like writing lambdas now. Uh, this is actually using the Emacs display table, uh, or, or it might be doing it with, with, um, with font lock. Let me see. It's hard to search for the word lambda, though, because these are actually lambdas. <laughs> That's the life we lead, isn't it? All right. All right, somewhere in my, in my uh, 4,000 line in it file, there is that code. Metadata on the Lambda? Where would that take me? Oh, my gosh. I didn't know Mac Lambda on subber.el. I learn something every day. Uh, anyway, you can do that with, 
Was there any, you know, I have it. I have it also in in my Haskell code too. I, I rewrite all of the operator names into the mathematical symbols so that I can read math. Okay, workgroups is a very handy little thing while you're programming. There have been many packages that do the same thing that workgroups does: e screen, el screen. The idea is is that you're deep, deep, deep in the debugger. Uh, let's see. Let's go over to our two here. Let's run it in edebug. And I'm here, and I hit my stack trace, and I got all this contextual information. But now I need to go off and do something else. So with workgroups, you can just basically create a alternate workspace that now I can go do whatever I want. But that other workspace is still there and has all the exact same window and frame properties that it had the last time you were there. So this is my alternate workspace. This is my main workspace where I'm showing you the stuff. So this is a way of just basically pushing context onto a stack and then coming back to it. And that's very handy when you're doing email list development and you want to go spelunking into the info manual or something without corrupting your, your, your debug session. Workgroups, yeah. Um, I've used them all. I've used eScreen, ELScreen, workgroups. There's a, I think there's even one other one for giving you screen-like functionality in Emacs. I picked workgroups because I liked the... I liked the code, and also it was the most maintained at the time that I picked it. I think EL screen had sort of, the, main, the maintainer had decided not to work on it anymore. If, they, if, that, if that's wrong, let me know. But workgroups works very well. Then there's Yasnippet. Who here has not yet tried Yasnippet? Ah, you have many good things ahead of you. <laughs> so Yasnippet is, um, there's an editor called TextMate, which had the most brilliant uh, snippet expansion mechanism that that I'd seen. You could you could create a snippet and you could create all these insertion points within the snippet, and the snippet would expand in context and re-indent itself appropriately to where you expanded it, and then you tab through the insertion points. And it's very very simple to create a, a snippet. You just uh, let me show you an example of a snippet here. Do I even have any Emacs list? I do. I have a header snippet. So whenever I create a new Emacs list mode, which happens often enough that I wanted to snip, snip it for it, I don't want to retype all this boilerplate every time. So I have a snippet up here, which inserts the evaluation of uh, some list code, because I know the name of the header is going to be based on the name of the file. So that's all I do is I grab the name of the file. Dollar one says, this is the first place I want you to come to when you're going to be inserting your own text. Then I have some more list snippets that you can see with the back ticks, and then dollar two, and then dollar three with a default if you don't want to specify it. So let's see what this looks like. Let's create a file. We'll call it uh, emacsconf.io, and I'll type hdr, and then expand the snippet. So you can see it already put in all of the Lisp expanders that I have there. So this is a mode written. And I hit tab, and it goes to the next insertion point. So I'll say conference list fun. And now you can see this has a, has a default. And I don't want to do anything there, so I'll just hit tab. Now I'm going down to which group is this. It's in the Emacs group. And then finally, uh, sometimes there's interactions between a yeah snippet and autocon. And then I end up wherever dollar zero is, which in my case will be the commentary, because I want to write something longer about the mode. And that's, that's basically asked in a, in a nutshell. So what it can do is as complex as you can imagine it to be. So it's kind of one of these things we've done often in the Emacs community, right? Some other editor has a cool feature, and we just assimilate them. We're like the Borg of editors. I will rewrite your feature, but I'll do it in Lisp. Um, Highlight CL is a little handy one. If you've been on the Emacs Devel list at all, you know that there's sort of this evil stigma surrounding the common list macros, even though common list has some just beautiful functions in it that we want to use in our code. You're allowed to use Emacs list, uh, common list macros as long as you, e you require in the CL library with, under an eval when compile. You cannot use common list functions. So what highlight CL does, uh, it's on Emacs wiki, is any common list macro or function that you use gets underlined. And so it's in blue if it's okay, if it's safe by GNU standards because you're only using a macro. It'll be red if you're using a common list function. And I say rage against the machine. Go ahead and use them, but you won't get them accepted back. Anyway, that's all it does, really.
Uh, info look more. So you're sitting here in your code and you're like, hmm, if I do control H F and I look for map car, that gives me a little brief description of macro map map car. But I'm really into reading. I want to know what map car is all about. So I type control H, control I, and then I look for map car. And what this does is it will plumb all the Lisp related documents that I have on my computer. Emacs Lisp reference manual, the common Lisp hyperspec, everything Lispish. And in this case, it took me to the hyperspec. This is everything those guys wrote about Mapcar with all their examples. So info look more allows you to associate a set of documents with a mode, any programming mode. This works for C2. I have this up so that it'll take me to the, uh, the, the, the live C documentation that comes with GLibity. So if I forget, for example, whether F puts wants um, a null terminated string or something like that, it'll, t it'll jump me into that documentation. It really only works well, of course, for info manuals, but it does work well when it does. So info look more is another great resource, especially if you're learning a lot of these list functions and you don't necessarily know all the, the nuances. Back each save. As you write Emacs Lisp code, your code's going to evolve at a very rapid rate. And at least I get so into it, it's so much fun that I forget to commit to Git. Right? I'm just saving away, I'm hitting Control X, Control S. And now I realize a couple hours later, oh, that function I deleted hours ago that's no longer in my undo limit, I want that function back. So what can, how can I get it back? Well, there is no way to get it back. It's just in the bit bucket now. So what I started doing is every single time I save, it makes a new backup file. So that for actively edited buffers, I have literally thousands of copies of my file. But you know, hard disk space really is cheap, and the overhead of creating these back files, backup files is not very high. And it has paid off many, many times. Yes? You might want to look up git whip, um, and, and it's support in recent, uh, uh, added a few m months ago to, to Maggit. Um, this creates, under a special git, uh, git is not entirely like a branch um, in, in conjunction with an, uh, with an after save hook, it creates a git commit every single time you save. Oh, and, then nice. and then garbage collected after the, uh, when git gc runs in the same way that everything else which is on the hook from, uh, from git gets garbage. Git garbage. wip? Yes. Oh, that's worth looking up. It's quite, it's quite nifty uh, and it has the same effect. You can completely sure. ignore the uh, uh, mere things like how have I did this um, three, three weeks ago. <laughs> it's still there. What happens if you hit the auto garbage collection threshold? Um, it never garbage collects it the first time. It'll need to be the second time, and only uh, uh, because only then will the appropriate time have passed since the last garbage collection. Uh -huh. The um, loose pack, whatever it's called. Well, you know, in addition to this, I actually also run a program I wrote called Git Monitor, which is um, is, is on GitHub. It sits in the background and every 60 seconds snapshots any changes that have happened in your Git project. I do both <laughs> because sometimes that data is just, it's valuable and you forget how you wrote it. And it, why not? Why not just keep it all? I keep it for 28 days, all these thousands of copies. So anyway, that's just part of my working uh, environment that I recommend. Yes? It also gives you, uh, doing the whip or uh, auto, auto commit, it also gives you very fine resolution for doing yes. it by set. Yeah, oh, that's true. Really fine with these. Very handy. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Let me, let me look at my uh, backups directory here. So, how many files do I have in here? I have 14,648 backup files. And you can see how many of my init files are here. And then, like with Emacs, they get version numbers behind them. So, like, here's... I think, I think the, the ones that I do with backup each save, I put timestamps as their, as their backup number. So you can see I was working on main.hs there for a while. But Ace jump mode is something that somebody else showed. I finally found a good binding for it. The problem was I wasn't using it because I didn't have a really convenient binding. And then I discovered, you know, meta h isn't really used by that's, that's just where you can say, oh, I'm looking at this code. See, this was something VI was really awesome at, was looking at a cursor, looking at a character on your screen and getting there. VI could beat Emacs at getting to a specific character position. For me, it would be Emacs every time because I would be like, okay, 4K, F, open parent, 3L. And then with Emacs, I sort of had to hit meta F, 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 control P, 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 P. And then you do control U, control P, and they'd be like, control U, control U, control P, control U, control U, control P. Oh, that's hard. I want one that goes eight. Control U, control P, control U, control P. 
Anyway, it drives you nuts. Now I can look at that B over on the edge, and I can say, okay, boom, I'm there. I'm there in a second. I, I type Control H, which puts me in this mode where it wants to know what character. And it's not any character. It's a character that's at the beginning of a word. So I want to go to that smart compile that's next to colon command. So I hit S. And now it grays everything else out but the key letters. And it gives them, it gives them, uh, there's, there's like Conqueror, right, does this. There's a couple web browsers that have, this, that have this paradigm. And then you hit that key letter, and then it just puts your cursor there and restores the text of your buffer. How? Oh, I got to Got to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what, what's that? What's... Normally, yeah, normally it, it does push the mark. Pop mark will normally work. Where Ace Jump Sync? Where, where Ace Jump Sync mode is useful is if you've got multiple multiple frames on the screen or multiple or or, 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 or multiple windows, it will jump to it will. Search all your windows and hop back across windows. Oh. Switch windows to the one you were in before. I so think I need y'all get to update my ace jump. <laughs> oh, it does. It does push the mark though. So just control U, control space takes me back to where I was. That's handy. Any other questions? No. Last one. All right, Magit, of course. Magit is the way that I start my development in any project on any given day. So I want to work on something. I'll hit my key that opens up a Magit. So let's go to my Emacs directory. And then this sort of becomes my, my jumping point for doing anything. I'll look to, I'll review what have I changed lately. I'll check out my diffs here. I got a little comment there for something to restore after this. Um, I cannot recommend Magit highly enough. I mean, Git's a great version control system as it but Magit really takes it to the next level and makes it something incredibly powerful. And then it's not just about version control. It's about, it's kind of like this little manager helping you with your workflow throughout the day to see how are your changes evolving. You can uh, very, very easily commit things a hunk at a time. I can see I'm, I'm on this hunk and realize, oh, okay, I just hit S. And that hunk gets staged down here all by itself. Is there anybody here who hasn't used Magit yet? Okay, a few people. All right. <laughs> Are you also not Git users? <laughs> yeah. True, true. And while I'm in a single buffer, I do actually use VC commands. It's very handy to be able to type control X equals and get a diff with the very last state that your buffer would in. That's great. But in terms of project-wide view, like sort of a bird's eye view of the whole project, uh, nothing, nothing beat magic, beats magic for me. And, and also VC, I don't know what it does with submodules. Never even tried that. I don't use the control X V D, you know, the directory mode of VC. I don't use that very much. So EDIF and compare windows are also very powerful tools to use while you're developing in general and also with, with Emacs. Um, one of the cool things with magic, to just plug it again, is if I'm on a file in magic and hit E, it will automatically pop up an edif buffer to compare those two versions. If there is a merge conflict in that file, hitting E will pop up a three-way merge edif buffer to let me resolve the merges graphically. And I quit, it'll ask, well, if it had been a merge buffer, it would have asked me, do you want to play these merge resolutions? Makes it very easy to use. Compare windows is one of these little handy uh, tips I sort of found by accident. Say, I'm, say I have two windows here, and the, the top line differs from the bottom line, but I can't see it. I just can't, can't see where that's happening. Maybe I've pasted in two giant lists of output from uh, a Lisp evaluation, and I'm trying to find where exactly do they differ. Well, I can just put my cursor at the beginning of each block and type compare windows, and it'll just take my cursor to where they differ. Um, and also, if you have two separate buffers, and you narrow them, let's see, to narrow, I think I'm going to have to use an indirect buffer, won't I? Yeah, let's do an indirect buffer. All right, so I've got two views of my buffer that are narrowed. Now I think I can use if buffers. This is like demoed here for the very first time. Okay. 
All right, there we go. And now if I hit N, it'll highlight to me what the difference is word by word. EDIF can do whatever compare windows can do. It's just that sometimes using compare windows is a lot quicker. An indirect buffer says, I want a new view on the same buffer that can be in a different mode. Every property of the buffer can be different. It's restriction area, it, uh, what area you've narrowed in it, it's marks. Um, I don't, I think actually the text properties can be different. The only thing they share is the actual data content of the buffer. So what this can also be handy for, and I think I was going to mention, mention it at some point. Uh, um, if you have, for example, an HTML file, and you have a comment, and your comment is in some other language, you can actually just mark out the region of the, of the comment in that other language, clone an indirect buffer, and it will automatically make the indirect buffer be narrowed down to that other language, and then you switch the mode on the indirect buffer to that language. And now you've got full indentation and, and syntax highlighting support for that code snippet. And I believe that this is how org babel works when you use control C apostrophe to edit some code in a, in a sub buffer. Yes? Another user is the, I think it's called minibuff, um, the thing which it, it pops up a, 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 a a window to the side of your current window containing a, a, a containing all the text of your current buffer in tiny, 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 tiny text. So oh, yeah, the mini math so thing. See, the mini math, that's it. Right, buffer. right. Uh, that, uh, that uses uh, mini, uh, derived buffers. The only caveat, and it has to go to some effort to cope, to, to cope with this, is that, is that text properties and overlays are not shared, so it has to copy them by hand in order to make sure it gets all the text highlighted. Uh, uh, I see, <laughs> I see, yeah. Um, oh, and I can't, I mean, I would be remiss without mentioning speed bar. Mm. In speed bar, and now all of a sudden you have this code browser on the right hand side that you can use with your mouse. So it, wor it works with a lot of a lot of different modes. So in this case, it's showing me the various parts of my org mode buffer, my my top line entries. If I go to the Emacs list one, it's not going to show me anything because I didn't really have anything in there. Let me go over to my init. All right, so now it shows me all this crazy stuff in here. Oh, those are directories. I can do types, variables. I don't use my mouse, so I never use speedbar. It's like kind of funny I'm on a Mac, but mostly I'm in, in Emacs. Yeah, I have one button. Look at this thing. It's a giant square. Oh, it's my... Oops. So, that's all I have for you, if there are any questions. Actually, for speedbar, uh, you have a menu avec, uh, uh, with IDO, IDO with IDO menu. IDO menu. It just takes the, almost the same information and puts it in the IDO. Ah, I see. To help you navigate around. Yes. Oh, that's kind of cool. Hold on, let me make it of that. All right. As you can tell, I use org mode for absolutely everything. Uh, we got another question. Up front? Oh, oh and here. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that you could uh, stage things in um, individual hunks. You can, right. you can be more refined than that. If you have a, if you, if you just select a region, you can say individual lines or whatever the region you've selected and just stage that. So oh my if gosh. You, if you, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you, Flatermouse. That is awesome. You know, up until now, what I've been doing is I would go into the buffer, I would kill that line, I would go stage what I wanted to stage, come back in, yank it back in. Yeah, yeah, but sometimes you want to stage a line within a set of lines of changes. That is really hard to do. Um, yes? Uh, so my question is not a technical question. And I don't think, but more of a cultural one, which is that I think I learned a lot. I've been using Emacs for a long time. You seem to have learned a few things from the tips. Um, and now everyone here knows, so that's great. There's a core community of people who know what you just talked about. But there's a lot of people who aren't here and probably aren't watching this thing who don't know. So would it be possible to make like a kind of Emacs tutorial 2 that would teach all of this stuff? Because Emacs tutorial 1 kind of is a little too basic. for. You mean kind of like, so you want to be a list developer, huh? Yeah, it's kind of like... <laughs> Like like the Emacs like the Emacs 
like you know, ELISP manual is to the Emacs manual, there should be an ELISP tutorial right. is to the regular tutorial. Yeah, there's there, there's one that's what, cast, casting lisp spells? I don't know if that one's for ELISP or not. They have an Emacs, but there's a version of it for Emacs. I think it's the closest we have at the moment. But maybe it, maybe on the new Emacs wiki it can be world editable and people can... That would actually be quite nice, yes. Yeah. Oh, all about macros? Okay, okay. Um, and certainly if anybody comes to IRC, I'm John W. there, I would love to talk about Emacs list development with anyone who has questions about improving their environment. Because really all of this ought to be joyful. It is a very fun environment to code in. I have probably spent more hours writing an Emacs list than any other language outside of C. Um, just because that's where I wanted to go as my refuge from working on C. Uh, fortunately, now I get to work in Haskell, which is almost just as fun as working in Emacs Lisp. We have yet some of the, the environmental things to solve in terms of the interactivity of the experience. But Emacs Lisp is, has been a great platform to develop it for a long time. Um, are there any more? Yes? Yeah, this may be a different question. I don't think it's just been you doing this. You've been completing in the mini buffer and getting your options to choose in the mini buffer. I've just never seen that before. Yeah. All right. So this, this is called IDO, I D O, okay. and I'm using a customization on top of IDO that's on Emacs Wiki called IDO Hacks, and IDO Hacks accelerates the selection algorithm to work for lists that are tens of thousands of items long. Um, IDO is absolutely invaluable, and now I have it turned on for almost every prompt. Not every prompt, but almost every prompt. I do. I do. I do. Okay, yes. Great. Yes. It's covering my Meta X. Actually, I, I never did I do with Meta X because it was so slow until I found I do hacks. And it was basically saying this makes it fast enough to use for your Meta X. Because Meta X, I mean, there's got to be 50 or 60,000 commands that Emacs makes available to you behind Meta X. And it's instant. Like if I just type or right, the list narrows as quickly as I can type. Or um, Meta X is SMX too. Yeah, there is SMEX, but I never had great experience with it. Plus, I do hacks with this kind of speed available everywhere. It's not just about the Meta X prompt. There is some um, there's uh, something which uh, which is very uh, um, which is called Helm. Oh it yeah, wants, yeah, it wants to encompass uh, many many auto completion and uh, snippet and and these kinds of um, narrowing down options. So, uh, yeah, Helm. It's called Helm. So, whenever I type, you know how in the Emacs environment, if there's a key map that wants you to type, say, Control X, Control R, something like Red Shank does, you can almost always type Control H for that something and get help on what that something could be. So, I have Helm tied in. So, if I ever do Control H like that, if I type, like, I'm in Red, I'm going to use Red Shank, and I never remember what the bindings are. So, I type Control X, Control R, Control H. And now I'm in Helm, and it's showing me what all the bindings could possibly be. So, I use Helm as that way to get that information. Also, if I type Control H B to describe key bindings, I get Helm, which cuts off, I think, 50 or 100 candidates. But if I type something like par edit, then I get that Helm narrowing to show me what all the bindings could possibly be behind par edit. And then Helm has this other really sexy feature where if you hit, uh, I believe you have to enable this. This doesn't come like this by default. You hit space and then another word, and it will search within the search. So that's all things that contain both par edit and all key bindings that contain both par edit and. And it's, it, it makes finding what you're looking for extremely fast. So I do, I do use Helm quite a bit. I, I also have one where I think control, control XF will give me a Helm of all the files that are in Git version control from this directory down. It looks very much like anything. Did you compare uh, Helm and anything? It is anything. It is the future. It, the maintainer of anything renamed it to be Helm. Oh, OK. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I used anything for these things before Helm. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I mean. It's open source. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, find somebody else to write documentation. 
Hi, um, I'd just uh, like to plug a library I've just finished recently called Simple Call Tree Plus, which is great for eList programming because it gives you a, a call tree of your code, so it makes it really um, easy to sort of get an overview of your code. And What's that second that, word? Uh, simple Call Tree Plus. Oh, Call Tree. Simple Call Tree. Uh, I'd, I'd extended it, put a plus at the end and, and added right. lots of extra functionality. Also, um, this is not to do directly with your talk, but um, when you were uh, showing your... Um, File of your, the outline of your talk, yeah, and you had it narrowed to a single. Yes. Um, how are you? Uh, That's org present. present. Org present. Yeah, you run org present, and now right and left arrow will go through your head headline items. Okay, great. And it, it also does neat things like if you have a, a this little code snippet is actually uh, marked out by org babel. It takes the org babel um, formatting out so that the code is very clear. Okay. But it preserves the syntax highlighting the, how the strings are highlighted. They're highlighted because they're in Org Babel and because I've turned that option on with Org Babel. But while I'm presenting, nobody needs to see the machinery behind right. the curtain. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, sure, I can do that. Doctor, would you mind me? <laughs> well, actually, let me tell Org. <sighs> Put up devel.org in <laughs> All right. Sometimes I need pestering <laughs> to get things done. Sure, yeah, I can put that up. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, question from yeah. RC here. Um, someone says, I'm prototyping something in e Elisp. I've dirtied the global namespace. How do I get clean again? I normally just restart Emacs. Oh, I see. Well, put all your functions in your namespace. But you mean he's changed something global and he doesn't know how to get back to the state he was in before. I guess. Yeah, well, control X, control C is the solution for that. <laughs> I actually, I mean, Dimitri was saying he doesn't start his Emacs in, unless it's a leap year, but I actually restart my Emacs quite often, so that's my answer to that question. It needs mul and you need to be able to push your state. That would be cool. Oh, go ahead, Nick. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a couple of tools. Now. There's a, a tool I wrote called Elper Kit, and there's a tool by somebody else called Carton, which let you specify uh, this stuff at a package level and then run the packages fast. Elper Kit will let you do is spawn up an Emacs with the code that you've just written uh, in the new Emacs and run tests in the new Emacs. So it's kind of like a uh, virtual M for Emacs. So you can, you can get around those kind of problems that the IRC guy is talking about that way. Anyone else? Um, uh, don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a user of Yasnippet yes, too. And of which? Yasnippet. Yes, oh, yeah, but okay. And what I sometimes discovered very recently, which is kind of awesome, is the hooks in Yasnippet yes, that allows you to execute the code after. As uh, yes. or before as Nippet finished. Yeah. And, and it's kind of interesting to do, do it uh, to create an instruction of a function or something like that, like Rechunk does, and go back where you were before or, or do things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Snippet is incredibly extensible. If, if you ever find yourself in your coding career doing repetitive things, probably Yeah, Snippet is the answer to something, question you haven't asked yet. Anyone else? One caveat with that snippet, which I've been repeatedly burned by, don't automatically upgrade it. The author, <laughs> it's used by lots of other packages, and the author breaks its API all the bloody time. I, I think I've been burned by it, by it randomly break, ch changing the way its functions work at least five times. Um, it frequently breaks auto complete, or and, and and its various hooks into yes snippet in the semantic bourbonator, um, which is extremely irritating because all of a sudden your Emacs doesn't start. <laughs> Now you know why we call it the bleeding edge, right? Oh, yeah. yes. You will get cut. So that, that was just, uh, that was kind of what I was getting earlier in the, uh, in the previous talk about, um, I've forgotten the name, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, about like the need for the community standardizing on some kind of versioning strategy, something like semantic versioning, I think would be a really helpful uh, thing if, if everybody embraced that. and. I got on board with the idea of if you're going to make an IPA cha API change, then you, you know, you increment the version according to semantic versioning, and yeah. that that would make 
life more pleasant. I think. Yeah. For, well, that, for that problem you're describing is a very deep one that some communities still haven't solved, and and who have been actively trying to for years. I, I mean, I think I think the solution is there. It's just a question of everybody agreeing on it. You know, so, I mean, yeah. semantic versioning is basically it solves the problem when when you couple that with a smart, um, you know, version analysis tool and dependency handling and so on. But anyway, it's a bit of a tangent. Um, Thanks. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Okay, final one. Final question. One more question for the channel. Um, do you know Skeleton and why use, uh, and if you do know Skeleton, why chose uh, why you chose Yasna but over Skeleton? Well, si since the beginning of of my coding career, I have had this problem of wanting to insert templates, and I have used maybe seven or eight different template libraries. There have been many, many in the past. And I think it may just be that Yas Snippet came to my attention sooner than something like Skeleton did, and when I found that it worked, I wasn't looking to change it again for change's sake. So I can't, I don't have anything bad or good to say against or for Skeleton. I just know that I picked Yas Snippet, it's been working great for me, and so that's why I've stayed with Yas Snippet. But yeah, one good about Emacs is you have a lot of options. There are many different ways you can do something. So thank you all. I will leave it to the next one.